If I want to take over a country, I want to make men obsolete. I want to make them docile. They were threatening to take me to jail. I'm like, off what? What law am I breaking? I'm not breaking a law. There's no law. The school system wasn't there to educate people. It was to school you. She was like, there's no way that we can publish this. They will kill us. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Money School Podcast, where we talk about how you get to discover the truth about money. Today, I am honored to do an in-person studio podcast with my good friend, Nick Kumalatos. He's a rock star, he's a badass, but he is here to talk to you about how hard is better than easy. Hard is the path. So we're gonna dive into that, let's go. What's going on, Nick? Thank you for having me, Chris. You're very this, welcome, man. This is, I think it's first one of the first live ones I've done with somebody else versus my own. I, I've never done a live studio podcast, so this yeah. is numero uno. Nice. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, before let's just dive right in. I mean, yeah. there's a lot to unpack here, but I want everybody that's watching this podcast to know a little bit more about you and, and your story and your journey, because you've done a lot. I mean, from, you know, your your troubled childhood mm -hmm. straight up through the Marines, becoming a Raider, everything you did there, and then the downfall after you came back just as know, a citizen, like you just, yeah. what happened? So can we just talk a little bit about that story first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, <laughs> I feel like it's a long book in, in itself. Um, but, but yeah, I, I grew up with a single mom, uh, with my, my little brother and, uh, it had its own challenges, right? Not having a, a positive male role model in my life. Uh, we did have a step, I did have a step dads for a while, but that, be, that became abusive until the age I was 11. Um, I don't know if you know this, but, um, most, uh, one in three men are physically abused. I did not know. And that. one in four men are sexually abused. What? Yes. And I've, I've been in groups of men where we can be vulnerable and open. And that is, that rings true. No matter how many times I do that talk and I talk to men, that is a fact. But the reality is nobody talks about it. And I can sit down with 20 men and that statistic will be a hundred percent correct every time one in three and one in four. I would have never thought right. that. And that's the reason why, you know, men self-sabotage and we become, and I have this acronym called, you know, men are salty, um, men are stressed, angry, lonely, tired, yet yearning for more. Um, and there's always this, even though they have family and they have people in their life, they still feel isolated and alone. They feel like they're on the island themselves, their own stressors, et cetera. Um, anyways, and, and that's the reason why they can never break through is because they're never dealt with that trauma as a child of, being either one of those. But so. another thing, and I don't mean to get into, you know, yeah. this, you know, while we're talking about your story, but right now I almost see it where there's a lot of families where the father is not in the family. Mm -hmm. Like they're just, just they're, it's almost like we're evolving into this time where there isn't the father right. figure. Or the father figure is just not the strong father figure that you, we all well, dream and we, of or and, think and about. We, right before we got on, we kind of talked to the to the group here, kind of reasons why. Um, and, I, and I make that analogy all the time. You know, me being former a former special operations guy, if I'm looking at a at a at a, a country, if I'm looking at a, a an area that I want to invade and do I want to affect in some way, I'm not worried about uh, women and children and the elderly. I'm worried about males, military age males, right? Um, like if you and I were going to invade Canada, we wouldn't be worried about children. We wouldn't be worried about Would the elderly. Would we be worried about anything? <laughs> no, no disrespect no, to Canada, no, but like we, I'm we, thinking that wouldn't be a big worry. There, there, there wouldn't be a big worry, but the, the only threat there would be men, right? So how do we, how do we neutralize that threat? Well, let's take a look at what's happened here. Like I would want, I, we would, we would want to make, you know, over a long period of time, we'd want to make men overweight, unhealthy, distracted, addicted to vices. Um, great book uh, that was written, I think 120 years ago by Napoleon Hill, um, Outwitting the Devil. Oh. Isn't that an amazing book? If you haven't read that, you need to read that. Read that. It, it really outlines like everything that the enemy, the opposition uh, gets you to be distracted. And whether it's from nicotine, booze, pornography, gambling, whatever it is, work. He calls can, it all out in the he book. He calls man. it all out. Um, the government and everybody is doing it. So if I want to invade a country, if I want to take over a country, I want to make men obsolete. I want to make them docile and controllable, addicted to pills and vices and et cetera. Because if, if there's a bunch of men that are not thinking for themselves that are addicted to vices and sitting at home and just checked out, well, I can do whatever I want to do. 
group of men can do whatever we want to do. And if you look at this country, it's really what's happened in this country as well. We've, we've taken men out of the, the leadership role, right? The, the setting the example role, the, the, the role of doing the things of, of what's in the family's best interest, what's in my wife's and family, my kids, my community. Um, I, and that's really what woke me up was in 2000 when the, the whole vid thing happened and my gym got raided by the police. I don't know if you remember that. I remember you telling me yeah. about it, yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was an illegal, uh, it was, a, it was you know, a, fourth, a Fourth Amendment break. It was a legal seat search and seizure. They had no warrant, and they, they came in and raided the gym with guns. And um, I was just shocked, man. I was like, how, how did we get here? How did we get here? And when I really started to peel the layers of the onion back, I realized that, it was us. It, we were our, it was men. It was my fault just as much as anybody else. I, because I checked out, right. I was like, well, I'm just going to do my own thing and worry about myself. And, you know, and I, I stopped leading. I stopped leading. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, we can get into, but if I really just look at it, it was like, oh, because if men were fit, healthy, operating at their highest capacity, collectively i'm not saying one man it doesn't take one it needs to be all of us right if all of us are operating at this level to where no we make the de we make the decisions for ourselves we make the decisions for our families and our communities well men would have came together and they would have been like no this isn't what's best interest of our our community it's not what's in the best interest of our our families these there, there's been these small businesses that have been around for 30 years that that they lost everything so no, we're not going to play your games. We're not going to abide by these these tyrannical law or not even law, rules. You know, there, nothing was a law. I mean, they were threatening to take me to jail. I'm like, off what statute? What what law am I breaking? I'm not breaking a law. There's no law. If, I, if you would have taken me to jail, the judge would be like, what are you charging them with? Yeah. There's no charge. Um, but we didn't do that. We just folded. Like we just folded like a house of cards. And that's when it really woke me up four years ago. It's like, oh, we have a we have a systemic problem in this country where men are not setting the example and leading um, their communities and families the way they need to be. And you do a lot of coaching around that. I watch and, your stuff and on now your YouTube and your Instagram. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean. and, and what really was interesting is in 2018, a good friend of mine, Kirk Weisler, and this was kind of 2000, you know, 17, 18 is when things really started to turn around for me. And he bought me this book um, called, where will you be in five years? You ever seen that? No. So it has a big five on it. So anybody go on Amazon, buy this, buy this book. Where will you be in five years? Don't freak out. It's more like a picture book. So it's not like a- oh, I like picture books. Yeah, it's like really big letters, lots of pictures, you know, very graphically designed. Um, it's about this big. Um, so it's not some really deep, you know, long journey that you have to read. But what is, in, and I don't even really even believe in the five-year picture because if I- went five years ago today and, and, and think of, there's no way that I could have envisioned. I believe in vision. I believe in having clarity. That's absolutely a must, but life evolves. The, the point is that you need to continuously move forward. But anyways, what this book got me to do was it asked me a series of questions that made me how to go really internally. And in 2018, I learned what my personal mission in life was, which gives you clarity and gives you direction, right? So through that book, in answering the questions that are in there and really doing some self-reflection, I came with, you know, my mission on this planet in this chapter of my life is to inspire, educate, and motivate others to live a healthier and successful life. Chris, at that time, I was not even doing that at all. Like you weren't living that life. No, no, no. I wasn't. None of my businesses, none of my output was in any way, shape, or form to inspire, educate, and motivate others to live a healthier and successful life. Like I was doing other things. I had seven different businesses. I was buying and selling things. I was, I was just doing me. And I was really, at that time, I was on social media. I was doing YouTube. I was doing different things. But nobody knew my political affiliation. Nobody knew what my religious thought, beliefs were. I was just, you know, in the mindset of that's nobody else's business. You know, like the dinner table, right? You yeah. don't talk politics and religion. Don't at talk money. Yeah, don't talk money, politics, and religion at yeah. the dinner table. And the reality is that's all I talk about at the dinner table now. <laughs> like we're getting into all three of those things. That's all we talk about. And, um, but I was, I believed that. Right. And I was like, well, I just want to do my thing. I serve my country. Now it's my time. Right. Uh, and I wasn't doing any of those things, but through that clarity, 
things started to take a different turn. And then when 2020 happened, I just kind of, I was like, oh, this is, this is, we're done. I'm, I'm going on the offensive here. And, uh, and during the pandemic, during the pandemic, I went on the offensive and man, I'll tell you what, the amount of P the amount of people that I've been able to serve and, and not even me change their life, giving them the opportunity to, to do the work and, and them change their lives and save families and be and them and watching these dads become to be honest chris like to, to watch these dads become the dad that i needed right the father that i That's needed powerful. to show up um watch them and and their and to hear the the, the to get these messages from the wives saying nick i can't even thank you enough like you gave me my husband back <laughs> like you gave us a member of our family back and I get those all the time. And it's just, it, what an incredible, like the, the fact is every single person that's reading, uh, listening to this, that's watching this, that's in the crowd here, every single person here was created to be great. Like, I believe that. Like you were out of the womb, you were created with greatness. But over the years, what happens is things chip away at you the opposition, the things in your life, you know, evil, whatever you want to call it, chips away at you. They distract you. They want to, they want to, you know, get you addicted to vices. They want you to all do these, all these different things because it keeps you from your, from your greatness. Let me just put a pin yeah. in that real quick. Folks, when you're listening to this, if you have not read Outwitting the Devil, uh, th here's the thing It'll I got to say, life, and you, yeah. it will change your life. Yeah. But everything you just said is, is, in that book, when was that book written? It was written it was way a, before it was, it was published. Like, I think it was 120 years ago. Um, he wrote it, and his wife, because of how damning it was to the government, the uh, the government, uh, the school system, even then, uh, the church. So it was really the th big three. It was government, church, and the school system. Uh, oh, and and pharmaceuticals. When uh, was it the Rockefellers. Roth Rockefellers that were doing the whole school system yeah. and the pharmaceutical industry? How they started that. It was so damning to that industry. She was like, "There's no way that we can publish this. They Probably will, they smart. will, they will kill us. Yeah, like we will get, we will get killed." And um, so they didn't publish it uh, until. So the goal was, I think, when he died, they were going to publish it. But then she didn't let it. Pub they didn't publish it. His foundation or his family or whoever it was didn't publish it until his wife died. Hmm. Now here's the thing: that book. I don't know if you feel the same way I do. I, I've read that book, I think, three times now. The audio book is amazing. The last time I yeah. read it, I deeply read it. Yeah. And it takes more than he, one time. Here's, here's the thing. Like, whether you believe in God or the devil or, you know, whatever your faith is, I will tell you, he had a discussion with Satan. Yes. There, you couldn't write a book like that. No. Unless that actually transpired. There is yeah. no way he wasn't. That's why I like the audio book. That's why I like the audio book. The, the audio book is the one I like because most. that that dialogue back and forth, and he has him. He it's like almost like he's on him on the stand, and he's yeah. he's, he's sitting on a stage like yeah. this. He's interviewing yeah. the the devil. Yep. And he really was. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care what anyone says, and I bet you someday when I get to go to heaven and I meet Napoleon Hill, I'm going to ask him. I'm going to ask. Were yeah, you absolutely. having a discussion with the devil? And he's yeah. going to say, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's freaky. And uh, I just want to call out two other books. Um, there's another book of. Uh, uh, late friend of mine, Stefan Arneo wrote, and it's hard times create strong men. Yes. He also did a book, hard times create strong women as well. But like that book, you mentioned graphic, mm -hmm. like that book is full of just hard graphics to look at. But that book, I almost feel like every man and woman needs to read that book to kind of understand the path we're on yeah. because it goes all the way back in history and it walks through, it walks through the collapse of every great nation. And listen, if you like, if you read that book and you can't see similarities to today's times into what path we're on, it's a scary, scary thing. So well, I think what you're doing where you're coaching these men and bringing them to that point where they can be the father and the husband again, it's so needed. It's not just needed in this country. It's needed everywhere. Yeah. And, and, and if you, if you, if it's not, and it's not even for you, it's not even like I, I live this life and I do all these different things, not because I, for my own, satisfaction or my own success or anything like that. It's because I have a deep responsibility to my family and my children. 
Like uh, that is, it's not about me. And it's the whole thing with, and I say that, and I tell people, I'm like, listen, I, I tell these guys and I tell any women as well. I have, I have several very high level women clients that are just savages. I mean, they put some men, they put a lot of men to shame. Um, but it's the whole thing on the, uh, uh, on the plane. Like, you know, you hear, put your oxygen mask on first before you put it on your kids. And everybody's like, that's yeah. crazy. I'm putting it on my kids. Cool. So you do that and then you pass out and the plane goes down and you're dead and your kid's alive. Now what do you do? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Your kids, you left, you abandon your child. So the hope, the, and my wife gives a great talk on that as well. Um, you have a responsibility to take care of yourself first and foremost. Here's a really sad story that happened. So I was, I was talking to a guy who was type two diabetic, 400 pounds, and he had three kids and he was the sole provider for the family. And, and I, and it was, it was a financial objection. I said, listen, man, I'm going to be honest with you. He was late forties. I said, I'll be honest with you. Statistically, you have 20 years less of life than everybody else. Um, and, and I just told him, I said, listen, you're, you're being super selfish if you don't get your health in order because and at this, and he didn't have any life insurance. He didn't have like, there was nothing. He just worked and provided for his family, which is an honorable thing. He says, you should. But I said, if something, if something happens to you and like, that is super selfish to you to, to do that to your family. How did he react when you said that's selfish of you? I got a little, he got a little offense, like a, a little offended. Right? offended. Yeah. Um, and and I, I was being on, I'm just like, listen, I'm going to be real and honest with people. That's a hundred percent. You're going to get that from me. The I'm truth gonna, hurts. Uh, the truth. I'm going to give you the truth. And not because that, not because that I'm trying to be an asshole. It's because I deeply care about human beings and I want what's best for them. That's my mission on this earth. And unfortunately, sometimes it, honest, like, listen, you have a, go have an honest conversation with your wife about how you're showing up. That's going to hurt. Oh, absolutely. It's not going to feel good to be like, no, honey, so let me sit down. We're going to go knee to knee. And we're going to talk about how I'm showing up, how I make you feel. And what are the areas that I can improve on? You don't want to hear that, but I tell you what, it, once you do it, you'll grow from it. It's an uncomfortable conversation. I need to do that. But I, you, I need to. You will, you will have a better relationship with your spouse. So I want to give that up. I, I want to be that person for men. Anyways, so he's like basically said, you know, he can't afford it. I said, okay. I said, you can't afford not to do it. You can't afford not to do it. And you don't have to do it with me, but you need to do it and you need to figure it out and you need to go invest into people that are going to help you make that happen because you're 400 pounds and you're type two diabetic. And this, and this, that road only goes one way. And, um, so I made a little video online, uh, about, about that conversation and, uh, to make a point. And a lot of people were saying, you know, I'm an asshole and this and that. Um, but then a woman in her fifties, um, commented and told, told her story and, uh, and I actually talked to her privately afterwards, but she said, you're absolutely right. I said, I had, she goes, I had, we had the, I had the most amazing husband. Um, and he died in his early fifties, same thing, um, overweight health conditions. They said, and he, we talk all the time. Um, he had three kids, six grandkids, and we talk all the grandkids don't even know him and they don't remember him. And we talk all the time about how much they want him the grandfather in their life that the kids wow. needed their dad and the grandkids needed their grandfather and he was and and this was coming from his wife's point of view that he did everything he could to take care of everybody else but he never took care of himself and now we miss him so deeply because of what happened and um that's a tragedy there's too many of those stories there's too many of those stories Far too many yeah and it's, uh, you know, the, the final books, I mentioned three books, is one you mentioned in your talk, The Obstacle is the Way. Oh, yeah, Ryan that Holiday book, stuff. Yeah. That book got me to think yeah. different. Yeah, and uh, it's very much like what you're talking about. Yeah. The obstacle was his health. He yeah. put everything else first, but he didn't take care of his health. Right. And that obstacle that he needed to tackle was the reason that now like, yeah. they need him. And, and like I would talk to, to, to kind of like really make this a really plain concept to understand, if... If everybody that's listening or watching this, uh, and I asked some of the people in the audience here earlier, if you really think about your biggest accomplishment in life, the things you're most proud of, whatever it was, um, it's never something that just you just got for free. It's never something that came easy. 
it's always a huge challenge. It was always, and a lot of people say, well, man, just raising my kids. Well, I'll tell you what, being a father of a 22 year old, about to be 18 year old and about to be a four year old, like that's not easy. It is not easy, especially the two older daughters. Um, it, it is not easy, but it's something I'm deeply proud of. So if it's running the marathon, losing a hundred pounds, building the, you know, an eight figure, you know, seven, eight, nine figure business, um, whatever the thing is that you, that you sit back and you really think like, what is my biggest accomplishment in life? It's always something super difficult that you had to like sacrifice for, you had to discipline, you had to restrict yourself. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. It's always something that takes a struggle and takes hardship. So if the biggest accomplishments in life are the things that are the most difficult for us, why are we not just leaning into those things all the time? Because they're hard. Because they're hard. And we've, we've had this lie, to, we, we've been lied by the opposition that um, we don't need to, that, it's, that you deserve comfort. You deserve to um, have a break. You deserve to have all these different things. But what does that do? Like we're, we're, we're happiness. We're, we're human beings are the most happy when we are doing hard things. I agree with that hundred percent. When every single time that we start taking the easy road and we don't challenge ourselves, what happens? We become depressed. We become more stressed out. We deal with anxiety. Like you deal with somebody that has chronic anxiety. Look at their life. Do they ever do anything difficult? Do they ever challenge themselves? Do they ever push themselves? No. And they're more anxious than ever. You take somebody who's constantly doing challenges and putting themselves into, into difficult situations so they can grow, they're extremely happy. Yeah, they're, they probably have a hard life and they're, and they're tired and, and their body hurts sometimes, but they're on cloud nine. Yeah. They're on cloud nine all the time because they feel so accomplished. I mean, my, my team would probably definitely agree with me on this, but you know, we'll, we'll get on a path where things are going really well I would, in my opinion, I think they start getting easier. Things are just happening. They're just flowing. You know, it's it's almost every business's dream, right? Of right. like just everything. The self operating. managing company. Yeah, the self managing. Yeah. <laughs> and then here's me. I sit there and I'm like, okay, I, I get uncomfortable. Like I yeah. start feeling weird, and I'm like, we got to do something different. Let. And then I go into visionary mode, and I I dream up this new thing that's right. going to be freaking hard. And then I bring it to the team, and they're like, oh, here we go again. That's exactly. Come that's on. <laughs> And that's like, exactly, yeah, that's exactly, doing. if anybody's from my team's watching, they're like, as soon as things start to level out, I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh, it, we're putting the foot on the gas. Everybody brace yourself. <laughs> the Shana storm, loves the storm, oh, the my storm is she coming. <laughs> yeah. Like for instance, one of my, one of my businesses, um, Johnny Slicks, uh, fastest growing, growing organic grooming company. Before you get American into that, made. your hair is looking mighty good. Is that Johnny Slicks? That's Johnny Slicks. Yeah. Johnny Slicks. James Some people blood. even comment. They're like, man, you smell good. I'm like, that's Johnny dude, Slicks. This morning when like, when I, you know, we, yeah. we gave you a big hug, like I'm like, damn dude smells good. Now I'm not saying that anyway, like, listen, but like, um, Johnny Slicks is the reason for yeah, that. Yeah. Huh? So we started that company with $400. Um, my business partner started it and he was selling plasma to keep it going. Um, had his car repoed two days or two months prior to us partnering um, and establishing the company really from the, from the ground up. Um, but anyways, so 2020 was a big hockey stick year for us. Uh, I want to say 2021. Um, I think with all of the legal stuff that I was going through, fighting the town, fighting the government, fighting the cops, um, I kind of I don't know if I checked out or if I was just exhausted, but we had this huge hockey stick here. We had, we were just growing exponentially. And then we had one year that we grew, we had, we had good growth, um, but it was like an extra $600,000 in one year. And we were having like, we were doing, you know, over double every year, right? You guys are doubling. For doubling every, like uh, every year up until, up every year up until that year, I think it was 2021. And I remember 2022 and I was just like, it was just lackluster. It was like, yeah, we grew, but not really. And I, and I said that on, in December of that year, I said, I think it was 20, yeah, it was 2022 that has happened. So December, 2022, I said with the team, I said, Hey, I apologize guys. I took my, I took my foot off the gas. And I think it's because of all these other things. Um, but we are going to, we're going to, we're going to break some shit this year. So uh, I wanted to over double our business. So we went from like 2.2 .2 to 4.6 million. So you did double. Yeah, we did double. How hard was it? Exhausting. 
I mean, we, we like did we <laughs> we found some stress cracks and some. Yeah, you people. broke some stuff. We broke some stuff. That's important. We broke some stuff, but the reality is this. Um, and then I'll tell you before I tell you what we've really what we've done this year. Um, the reality is, is this is, and I needed the company to understand this. You have companies, big business that are not even American, you know, at this time, they're just corporations that are in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a company like, let's call it, let's say J and J. All right. This is public knowledge. You can Google this. Um, they got, they're in a class action lawsuit or have been, or I don't know if it's still going on for their sun, their sunscreen care. Um, that caused cancer. My wife talks, yeah, my wife talks about sunscreen all the time. Cause cancer. Yep. Like proven. There's a lawsuit That's about the stuff it. we used to use back when we were kids, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Well, if you look at their P&L, 40% of J&J's profits come from treating that exact type of cancer. Come on. Yes. Uh, an interesting one, a, a video that my business partner, John, made was they're selling... Uh, grooming products, shampoos, conditioners, things like that, body washes that cause hair loss because of the chemicals that are in that. That's probably the problem I'm having right now. And then it's getting a little thin <laughs> up front. I'm not going to lie. And then, and then right next to that is the same J and J product for hair loss. So you have to be careful of the company and, and, and the company that's selling the disease and the cure at the same time. And, and, I love the analogy that my, that John says, it's like, he's like, that's like me punching you in the eye. Um, well, actually you paid me to punch you in the eye and then I sell you an ice pack. Nice guy. Yeah. Nice. Super nice guy. <laughs> um, so like I had to get the company to like everybody in the company and, and the people to understand that, that these people, like we're really in a, in a battle. We're a battle against evil corporations. Um, their stuff's not, you know, a lot of their stuff's not produced here. It's all over the world. Um, it's got tons of chemicals in there. They don't care about you. Um, and we wanted to create a company, one that brought manufacturing back into the yeah, United States. You're 100% USA. 100% USA. We manufacture, we, we, there is no manufacturer. We are the manufacturer. That's awesome. So we are, we are vertically integrated. So we fulfill in house, we manufacture, we complete, uh, uh, uh B2C and, um, you know, direct the customer online through uh, our website and Amazon. Anyway, so last year we did, um, and just messaging that, just focusing on being the best brand that we can be, the best American-made brand that we can be, providing solutions to families and to men um, that have good, high-quality organic products that are not going to make them sick, that's going to make them smell good, which we have, I think at this point, we have 16 Johnny Slicks babies that literally people were like, they wore Johnny Slicks, walked past their wife. Two weeks later, they're pregnant. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering where we were going with this. I'm like, you got Johnny Slicks. Babies. So like, and, like, and the women, we, we've, gotten, we've gotten messages and emails of sonograms saying, we bought Johnny Slicks on this date. This is what happened. Here's the, here's the first ultrasound that we got. And I think we're up to, we're almost up to 20, I think at this point. Oh my goodness. And there's no telling how many people have, haven't told us. But anyways, so last year we did 4.6 and then this year we're going to break um, eight figures. That's amazing. So yes, talking about putting the hammer, put it, talking about creating stress, creating, you know, leading. Um, I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable amount of growth. But when you, when you really are looking at it from a, a broader lens, and that's when me and my business partner sat down and talked about it because he didn't like to talk about other companies. He didn't like to, And I said, listen, man, we are, you know, we're in a spiritual battle here. Like there's these corporations that are, yes, making, we all know that making money is good. It buys financial freedom. Sure. I can't, I can't support my kids. I can't support my mom. I can't support my, my in-laws. I can't support anyone. I can't give to charity unless I have money. Like that's the way it is. You're like, does money buy happiness? I don't know. There's a lot of things that can, you can buy that with money that makes you happy. Um, but I'll tell you what it does. It solves a lot of problems in the world. Can I add on that? And then we'll, we'll kind of, I definitely want to go to the money track, but money can't buy happiness, but money can buy freedom. Yeah. And in freedom, you find happiness. Right. Absolutely. I think that's the path. So, so because of this heart, because of this just driving and doing hard things and, and living in the uncomfortable and just being addicted to growth, um, that's how we've had these, you know, 
200% growth years every year after year. Um, and it's difficult. It is super, super difficult. But man, what a what an impact we're making on the world. What an impact we're making on families um, by doing so. So it's incredibly, incredibly worth it. How do you, uh, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges you're finding with that growth? Because that is tremendous growth. And when you grow like that, you do hit these levels where you'll have massive growth, but then you're going to face serious, serious headwinds. Mm-hmm. Like, are you there yet? Um, I think we, we've been Staffing there. Staffing and culture Yeah, we've been, we've that. been there a long time. So Staffing was always a big, a big issue until we uh, adopted um, kind of the, the kind of a little bit. I was telling you about the rules of engagement, core value talks. Um, we we implemented uh, Gino Wickman's EOS. I don't know if you're familiar, yeah, familiar, I'm familiar with, that. with that. Yeah, so we went all in on that um, and a couple other things as well. Uh, but we really developed what our core values were, and they weren't just words. They weren't just words on a on a wall somewhere. Our core values are our rules of engagement. It's how we grade our employees. So it's like we look at every single employee, look at the core value, and are they a plus, plus, minus, or a minus? And we value that we, we hire based off of those and we fire based off of those. But once you get people to get buy-in on those and they understand what that, like you call it the people analyzer, based off those core values, like where they show up, how, you know, we, we create rules of engagement for the business, it solves a lot of problems. So we don't really have, we have an amazing team. They understand their, line, their, their lines of delineation. They understand every single person knows what the vision of the company is. They know why we do what we do, how we're doing it, um, what the goals are. There's a lot of companies out there that hide their financial goals, what their profitability is, what their sales are like, what the, what the you know, there's not one person in our company that goes, oh, they're making a ton of money. No, no, they know exactly where the money is being spent. So because of that transparency, they have so much buy-in. They understand that, yes, you're making all this money, but they also know that where it's going. They know what the payroll is. They know what the advertising cost is. They know what the cost of goods is at every single level of the business. The customer service rep is, knows exactly what the financial... We have a... We use a so they feel Slack. vested in the company yeah, because they, they, they understand they the They understand. Company. So they get... Uh, we use Slack and we have uh, basically a daily sales report that goes to the business channel that everybody has access. So the day prior, they know exactly how much we made, what we spent, what the profitability is, what the cost per acquisition was for new customers, what the split between new customers and returning cut. They have, they have every day, the, every single person in the company sees that report. That's important. And, you know, I read a book back a long time ago. I don't remember what it was, but it talked all about that, like about literally like put your guard down as a business owner, show your team, show your team what money, you know, what, what it makes. And I started like literally in our team huddles, I started showing our balance sheet, our profit and loss statements yeah. and just saying, Hey, here's what it is. So they see like, listen, like the top line revenue is great. Yeah. But then look down here. This is, this is what matters. Yeah. That. And you know, this is where all that money went. And, and then once they start seeing that, they, they got that buy-in. Well, they get buy they, they get buy-in and it's like, well, I want you guys to make more money. Right, absolutely. So if I want to, if I want to be able to pay you more, this is what we have to do. Right. You know, so they're, they're invested in the growth of the thing. And that's, what's been a really beautiful thing for the, for that company is they're just, every single person is a culture fit and a core value fit. So let's transition a little and let's, let's go down the money rabbit hole here. Let's talk a little bit about that. As you've had success, you've made Mm -hmm. more money. What's changed in your life and how have you changed the way that money works within your own family? So uh, probably about around the time we met about three years ago, um, I was making good, we were making good money and and I'm going to talk on a personal level. I was making good money, but I, I all of a sudden had this fear that popped up in my life. The mo- like things are good right now. And I come from, Chris, I come from nothing. Like we're talking, you know, poverty, straight poverty. All right. Kid, you know, getting clothes at Goodwill, eating rice and beans kind of situation. Like not great. Rice you know and beans I mean? are my favorite food. So, you know. <laughs> um, uh, it was, it, it was less than desirable um, quality of life uh, back then. And so all of a sudden, you know, I've, I went, I joined the military, I invested in myself, I did all, I went through all these hard things. And then I got bit by the entrepreneur bug and, and started to, to rise over the past 12 years. And all of a sudden, I feel like there was this, le- there's a certain level that you hit with finances that you're like, oh, wow, I'm above the, the normal means to where I'm like, now I'm comfortable. Right. 
And my fear was it's good right now because the, the faucet's on. But if the faucet got turned off, if I stopped working these jobs, what would happen? I'm going to go backwards. Yep. So that's when I started like, okay, I need to figure something out. I, I need to take the money that I'm making and put it into things that are going to start making me more money. You wanted to make your money work for you. Yes. So that's the mentality shift was about three years ago around the time we met. We met, And that's probably one of the reasons why it's like I was, I was on this journey. I was seeking these things out. And, uh, and I believe when you start going down that path, I was talking to somebody in here earlier that when you start going, you know, I call it walking down the yellow brick road, you go on the journey, you meet people along the way, but you're never going to meet them sitting on a couch never. and not doing like you have to move forward. You have to start executing, even if it's blindly executing, you have to start moving in a direction. And then these people get put in your life, you know, God, universe, whatever you want to call it, gets put in your life that help you along the way. Um, you're one of those people. So um, yeah, so I started to, uh, really heavily take our, like, and, and painfully take the money that we were making and invest in different things. Within three years, we bought four different properties. We invested in two different life insurance policy or two personally and multiple across the business. Um, and it just started changing everything. Uh, for instance, what we did one with, uh, one of the policies were actually, uh, August 1st, we are this launching. Is awesome. Yeah, we were launching a uh, Toyota Tacoma TRD Sport giveaway. No purchase necessary for Johnny Slicks. Um, and, th and there's a couple different reasons, and we can get into the reasons why. But, um, yeah, so we used the policy, pulled the money, loaned it to the business. And then, and uh, so the way, you know, if you really want to get into the, the function of it, I borrowed the money from my policy, right? Um, loaned that money to the business, Right. And there's a tax advantage there. Yeah. And then I charge the business interest. Good for you. So my money is still. Can't in the, get money from a bank, you know, without nope. interest. So you're the bank. Right. So my money is still earning un, uninterrupted compounding interest sitting in there. And now I'm making another interest off of the business. Um, and then, you know, we're going to give this truck. It's a three month giveaway. We're going to give this truck to somebody um, that signed up for it. But, blowing um, someone's mind. Blowing somebody's mind. It's a beautiful truck. I was driving around. I was like, man, I actually like this truck. Steven, he's got one of those Toyota Tacomas. It's a, like, I'm blown away, man. Toyota Tacoma is a nice truck. Yeah, and this nice truck, vehicle, man. this truck actually has more features than my like 70 something thousand dollar you know, Silverado. Um, and I'm getting in here. I'm like, dang, this thing is nice. The, the dash speaker is a JBL. The whole system is JBL. I'm going down a tangent because I, I just, <laughs> whatever. It has a button, Chris. That it pops out and turns into a Bluetooth speaker so you can go, go hang out in the back of the truck. Come on. Yes. So you can play music in your truck or just connect your phone to the speaker and then plug it out and you can go like park your truck on the beach and then pull the Bluetooth speaker out and play music. There's all, all kinds of little things. With all this of that's super cool. My 1979 yeah. Porsche out there, yeah. I can just go out and pull the speaker out too on that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyways, it, it's a pretty rad thing that we got to do. But, you know, talking the money, the money system. So looking at uh, rental properties and, and we have used um, I used my policy to, to for the down payment on, on a couple of different rental properties uh, my primary and we just keep cycling this thing and it just continues to build and I remember you telling me three years ago that hey this is not an this is not a quick thing it's about a three-year build but at the three-year mark is like when you go oh wow the power that you all of a sudden have and and again three years ago we went into it, all across, you know, and, I, and I've done everything. I've diversified. I've got policies. I've, we're into crypto. We're, you know, real estate across the board. But it was painful at the first. Yeah. But now it's like, oh, wow. I, I inadvertently became a millionaire just by taking the money that I'm, you know, not living like an asshole, you know. And That's step one. Not live yeah. like an asshole. Don't spend every dollar you no, make. No, nothing Keep really. You make. Not, honestly, nothing really changed for us. Like the, our quality of life, nothing yeah. really changed. We just kept it the same. But we just took that money and started putting it into places. But now quality of life has changed quite a bit because now we have residual income. If I stopped working today, not, not much would change. You know, obviously I'm not never going to stop working, but things wouldn't change. But man, the, the peace of mind and the freedom that, that you get by sacrificing for so long and then putting those, into, putting those, those methods in place that you teach really does... Uh, change your life. And I think it gives uh, you freedom. One of the things you said that I really want to unpack for the audience and also the live audience is 
you were working really hard. Your business was growing. But then you had that realization that, holy crap, if I stop working, if something mm-hmm. happens and I can't work, yeah. the faucet shuts off. It's done. Everybody that lives will come to that realization. It will either be early enough to do something about it or too late. Yeah. Because there will always come a day where we can't work the way we thought we could. Right. There will always come a day where something happens. And you should And we can't... It, <laughs> Yeah, but that's not what we're told. Right. We're told you got to work, work, work until you get to 60 or 60. Now it's like 67. You know, then we're going to give you, you social vacation, security. Right? Then you yeah. can take your vacations. And most people at that age, like they're just so beat down and exhausted that that isn't, that is, you don't leave your bucket list. Yeah. But the problem in society and the problem that we're taught from literally from a young age, from our parents straight through is we're taught to work for money, yeah. trade hours for money and put a value on our hour, which our, our time, our, our hour is absolutely priceless. It is the most yep. valuable resource we will ever have because we can never get it back. Can't money. Buy it. No, nope. can't, can't replace it. Money's no. easy. Yeah. You can always make more money. Yeah. You can always find ways to find more money. But when you constantly live your life trading an hour for a dollar, you can never obtain wealth wealth and you'll never see freedom because that's a trap. But once you like, well, you, I'll use your situation where you figured out, I got to figure this out and mm-hmm. I got to find a way to make money work for me. And money doesn't have the restrictions we do. It doesn't need vacations, doesn't need to sleep, uh-huh. doesn't need to eat, doesn't nothing. It can work 24 seven and it will yeah. uninterrupted compounding interest. So you figured that out. But the thing that you said too, that I think is very important for the audience to pay attention to is it didn't happen quick. We live in a society, almost the McDonald's society, where we want it our way right away. Instant gratification. Instant gratification. And that's why so many people taste what it's like to be rich to end up being poor again. Mm -hmm. Because it's a cycle. That's what will happen. The difference between rich and and wealthy is so simple. Wealthy people have figured out how not to give the money back because they've figured out how to make money work for them. Rich people have figured out how to work hard, get a break, make a bunch of money, but then all of a sudden they haven't figured out how to break that so then all of a sudden they end up poor again it, right. it's it's a fact and uh i think what you said is so vital and i i just wish more people could learn that that's the secret that is literally the simplest thing but it's the hardest thing because no one will tell you how to do it you know it's very difficult to find the info and schools and advisors and everything else will tell you the exact opposite well, it's because they want you in the system. They need you in the system. I wasn't going to say it. You said it right there. Yeah. They need you to give right. up control of your money to them. Yep. They and I, and I And I talk about this a lot. You know, there's a reason why, if you look at just the mortgage, the mortgage um, products alone, right? So if you look at what uh, the, somebody will loan you, you want to, you make X amount of money, you want to buy, they're like, well, you qualify for this much. So what is it? 40% of your, of your pay, you qualify for a payment. Mm-hmm. So what does that do when you when you set that up? Just look at the system as a whole, as a way it's set up. So now your payment is 40% of your monthly income. You become a slave to the system. So now that's the reason why everybody's so paycheck to paycheck, right? Because the system is designed for you to be paycheck to paycheck. It's designed to give you enough, give you, give you more than you need, so that you have to continue to be in this rotation of like, I've got to go to work, i got to make money, so that I can pay this mortgage, and then it just cycles. And you're never able to get ahead. The system is designed. They're designed to give you, if, if they really cared about you, they'd be like, no, actually, you only qualify for 15, 20% of what you make, not 40%. But just imagine this, and, and you already know this because this is everything we always talk about and what you're doing now. If you could just change one thing, and that is where your money went first, and apply one step, one thing different to what most people do. You still make all the same payments. You don't work any harder, longer, or take on yeah. any more risk. You're, everything remains the same except for those payments that you just mentioned, those, that 40% of your income. Because mm-hmm. that's how most people are living, right? Their, their payments to their mortgage, their cars, their everything, student loans, is going to somebody else. But imagine if all those payments, you still made them, yeah. but they were written back to yourself. They were written back to your bank. How does that change people's lives? They still have all the things that they have now. They have the boats, the cars, the houses. Mm-hmm. But the payments... Go back to them every single month. That's what the wealthiest families in history have figured out. That's what you figured or, out. There's books all over there about it. There's the, for, for hundreds of years or over a hundred over years. Over a hundred years. years. Yeah. I mean, like, listen, we can say bad things about the Rockefellers, but they figured this out back in their day. That's why mm-hmm. their family wealth 
you don't even know what it is anymore, but it just keeps going up. It can't yeah. go anywhere else. But but all of the re- the point I'm trying to make here is if it is that simple, why don't people know it? But number two, why don't people do it when they're told? Like I'm but, out there speaking it, to well, hundreds no, of thousands Chris, of people. It is deep, deep programming. You got to think like the reason if you go back over 100 years talking about the school system, the school system wasn't there to educate people. It was to school you. It was to program you to a certain to get way. a job, to work for the Rockefellers. Exactly. I know. You know what I mean? So, so even me, like looking at, looking at like my, my son now will never see the inside of a classroom. Never see the inside of a classroom because I don't want him programmed that, that way. One, you know, we don't have to get into the school system, the public school system these days in the last four years, but there's, there's no way he'll ever see the inside of a classroom. The, guy, the kid's a genius. He really is genius. They've done studies where they've, they've, they've measured kids' intellect at two, three years old, and they're like, they're on a genius level. But then they, they do the same, they, they test the same kids at seven and eight, and they're way below. Why is that? What changed? Nothing changed other than they went to school. They got put in a box. So when I started talking to a guy named Matt Burdu about, about education and the way that human beings learn, um, and what real, what real true education is and how to teach kids, um, it was hard for me to even ask the questions because we've been so programmed. We're so programmed on, oh, this is the way. Well, they got to learn math and geography and all these different things. Yeah, 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 sure. I said, but well, how, did, how much do you use in, in life? Where's all the other things that you need? What is this education? How do you build wealth? How do you, how do you understand um, the value of hard work? How do you understand the, the value of growth and challenging your perspectives and what limiting beliefs are and history and what, how the rise and fall of civilizations and why they fall? Kids don't know that. No, we, they need to know that now. They, they need to know that. But, but what are they taught? They're taught exactly what they want to know. That they, it's, a, it's a lesson of memorizing data, yeah. not true education, not thinking for themselves. So if you look at all of us, we're all products of that environment too. And we've had a very difficult time breaking free from that. And sometimes, in some ways, we are still programmed in that. I guarantee all of us can get in a conversation right now about certain things, and we will catch ourselves regurgitating garbage of how we grew up, how we were programmed in life. And I bet you, I mean, thousands and thousands of people will see this, but if I asked thousands of people this one question, and that is, would you give up money? Would you take a loss for three years in order to make money for the rest of your life if without having to work any harder. I bet you every single person, and, and comment below if that's the case, I bet you every person would say they would give up three years of gains to make money for the rest of their life. But even though they say that, they won't do that. Right. Because less than 1% of yeah. all those people that said, yeah, I'd give up money for three years to make money for the rest of my life, they wouldn't do it. Well, and, there, and there's a, there's a, and they're so programmed that they don't, there's no trust there, right? So they're like, oh, no, it's a scam. It's yeah, this. It's a scam. It doesn't it's work. It's a scam. It doesn't work. You know, there, there's, there's something that they're doing that they're lying about, that they're not telling you, that they're not telling you um, that this system is, is the system. That's the way you're supposed to do it. Uh, but the reality is that's it. It's just a fear. It's a fear. They're, they're stuck in a fear loop um, and, instead of, you know, breaking free from that system. Well, I want to wrap with this this little segment because it's just brings it all together. And it's an Earl Nightingale thing that he did in the strangest secret in the world, which to me, you know, we talked about books, everything else, folks, if, if you really want to change your life, Google Earl Nightingale's the strangest secret in the world, listen to it straight every day for 30 days and go longer. If you can challenge yourself, I, I challenged my team to do this for 30 days in that book or it's not a book, but it, it is a book, but it's a, just a YouTube video. He talks about a study where they took 125-year-olds, eager, optimistic 25-year-olds, and asked them a single question. Will you be successful at the age of 65? What was the answer? Yes. Of course. Everybody. An overwhelming response of yes. Actually, actually, the 25-year-olds were like, that's the stupidest question. Of course, of course I'm going to be, be successful. successful. Yeah. But now if you roll the tape and you fast forward to when they're 65, statistics play in. And Social Security will tell you the truth. Out of those 100 eager, optimistic 25-year-olds, at 65 years old, only five of them will be financially successful. Wow. Only one of them will be wealthy. One out of 100 will be wealthy. And you ask yourself, how can that be? So that's, most people stop there. They say, well, how can that be? And then they go on with their life. Yeah. Earl is like, fuck this. I want to know why these five are successful and the other 95% weren't. 
What do you think the reason was? I'm, I'm what did gonna, those five do that the other 95 didn't? I'm going to have to say power of belief in themselves. What did you, well, okay, what did you do? Action. No, you created. Yeah. You created yourself. You created your mindset. You created your business. Yeah, I took action on all of that. My personal yeah. growth, it's all my just business. Creation. Yes, execution. Yeah. I just executed. Yeah. Those five created the life they wanted. One way or the other, they created it. And all the stuff you said makes fits into that creation. Yeah. So now, second part, what did the 95% do? What the plan was? Conformed. Yeah. They conformed followed to somebody's the, the, failed yeah. agenda, somebody's failed idea, and somebody's failed financial plan. That's what happens today. This is what we're supposed to do. Yeah, this is what we're supposed to do. I should conform. I've dealt with it so many times in my life. Can't you just be happy? My father saying, hey, just come with me. I'll get you a job at the factory. You know, when I had this dream of a skateboard snowboard shop that was like so outlandish for a 17-year-old. But like, that's the thing. We actually, most people in society, at least 95% of them, listen to other people telling them what their life should be. When we grow up, we come out of the womb we Perfect. are the ultimate, yeah. ultimate beings for creation, and we want to create. Watch a kid. That's all they do. Their imagination runs wild. They're running around creating things, and then all of a sudden, when society kicks in, we start conforming because we're told to, and then we start believing the bullshit and listening to people tell us, this is what your life should be. You shouldn't chase that dream and open that business. You shouldn't go out and do this. You should just conform it's and too risky. take a job and be it's happy. Too risky. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's just so sad. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say to those 95%? I mean, if you, it, at the end of the day, it's a personal choice. If you want the things that your heart desires, you have to go execute. You cannot stay stationary. You cannot listen to the masses. And one piece of advice that I'll give them is this. Look at the person giving you the advice. Is that the life that you want? Do they look, smell, feel? Do they have the bank account you want? Do they have the relationship with their wife that you want? Do they, do they look like the way that you want? Do they have the house that you want? If they don't, then why would you listen to them? So like no offense to anybody's parents, but like I look at my parents, I don't want their life. Why would I listen to their advice? It's no offense. I love my parents, but I, I want more. I want better. So your risk management fear tactics that you're giving me about not starting a business or join, not joining the military, not doing this and that, the reality is they want people to be safe. They want people to be protected. Well, guess what? That, would that get you? Nowhere. It gets you nowhere. Yeah, this is risky. Investments are risky. Real estate's risky. It's all, it's all scary. But it's the, it's the only way that you grow. I'm going to tell you something. There's a whole other Earl Nightingale thing about the risk takers. You know who the risk takers are? The play it safers. They take the most risk because their dreams die in the cemetery. Absolutely. Fear. Fear is the, fear is the yep. killer of all dreams. And yeah, I, have I lost? Sure, I've lost. Of course, of course I've lost. But I, I, because I haven't quit, I'm win. I continue to win. And you will. I don't quit and because I, I continue to move forward. Because you so, keep creating. So just be careful of who's, who's telling you. Like you're talking about like, you know, your dad and telling you to go to the factory. It's like, if that's the life that you want, sure, take that advice. If that's, not the, that's not the life you want. You'd be very careful of who's giving the advice. Look at where it's coming from. Look at their life. And is that what you want? No. Then their, their advice, no offense, their, their advice is not valuable. I want to take advice from people like, I look at somebody, I'm like, that's what I want. I that's that. the financial freedom that I want. That's the lifestyle I want. How did you do what you did? What is the belief pattern that you set in yourself? What is the affirmations that you tell yourself? What are the things that you're putting to the universe? How are you investing your money? Where is the education that you're getting? That's what I want. I'll take that advice. Nick, where can people find Johnny Slicks and your other company, Core Medical Group? I mean, mm -hmm. you got so many companies, but where do they find you? And, and also, let me just tell them, YouTube. <laughs> His YouTube channel is badass, but I'll, I'll let yeah, you know. Yeah, so if you, if you Google my name, Nick Kumalatsos, or even Nick the Marine Raider, uh, I'll pop up. But yeah, everything that I'm involved in from men's optimizing hormones to physical fitness to the mindset to scaling businesses to Johnny Slicks, uh, organic grooming products, you'll find it all there. I love it. With that being said, folks, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Money School Podcast. It is time that you learn the truth about money. See you on the next one.